Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to OpenView's webinar series. My name is Sarah Duffy, and I am a talent manager here at OpenView. Uh, for those of you who might not know, we are a venture capital firm based in Boston, really focused on expansion stage software companies and helping them to acquire, retain, and really grow the right customers and talent. Um, if you want to more, learn more about us, just head over to openviewpartners.com. So today's webinar is centered around this whole idea of talent KPIs and, and the importance of defining success metrics when it comes to hiring. So whether you're a CEO, a co-founder, a head of talent, a hiring manager, this is a topic that will resonate with you in some way. Our hope for you after you hear from the group is that you'll walk away with some key strategies for improving your hiring process and, and achieving your talent goals faster. So leading this, our discussion today will be Vinaya Grenade, uh, founder and CEO of Drafted. And joining him will be Adriana Roche, VP of HR at Segment, and Richard Fye, Head of People Ops at Datadog. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, there will be time for Q&A at the end, so if questions come up, uh, please just use that chat feature on the left side of your screen, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, we'll also be sending out the deck and a recording of the entire webinar afterwards, so keep an eye out for that. And all that being said, Vinayak, I will turn things over to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, hey everyone, uh, really happy to be here and uh, really excited uh, to, hear some, uh, to hear some great insights from both Adriana and Richard today. Uh, so uh, just so you know who I am, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Drafted, and we make software for increasing your referral program to both inside and outside your company. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to drafted.us. Um, but without further ado, uh, I wanted to introduce um, our, two, our two panelists today. Um, the first one is Richard, uh, and he, uh, you know, and he, and he runs people ops over at Datadog. And uh, you know, in, in, instead of instead of totally butchering, um, you know, the the culture pitch for Datadog, I'm uh, I'm going to ask Richard to uh, maybe say maybe say uh, a couple of minutes of introduction. 
Uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, my name is Richard Fye, and as an AX said, I do lead people operations, the HR team uh, at Datadog. We're about uh, 350 employees and growing uh, quickly, uh, expecting to add as many as 200 uh, new people by the end of this year. And uh, Datadog, we are a, a monitoring uh, infrastructure monitoring solution. Uh, we're a technical product for technical people. Uh, so I won't uh, attempt to really get too much more into uh, the, the, the product as, uh, as I can't speak to it uh, super well. But um, looking forward to sharing some insights based on what I've learned here at Datadog over the last about 15 months uh, that I've been with the company. Uh, awesome. Thanks so much, Richard. And yeah, just so everyone knows, uh, Datadog is definitely a high-flying startup. Uh, I think the last mention that they had in TechCrunch said that they had raised almost $150 million to date. Uh, so they're definitely uh, definitely going places. Um, and, uh, and, our, and our second uh, our second panelist today is, uh, is Adriana, uh, who is the VP of HR at, at Segment. Um, I'm sure that most of the companies uh, that you represent uh, probably use Segment without even knowing it. And uh, so, uh, uh, could you say, <laughs> uh, could you could you give everyone an overview? Uh, sure, sure, and thank you so much. Um, just like Richard said about Datadog, we're an incredibly technical product. Um, so I won't go too deep into it, but pretty much what we do is we're a data analytics platform, and we help companies route all of their customer data from where they where the interactions happen, like your cell phone or um, in a laptop and then route that into data analytics tools to, to make better customer decisions. Um, so a ton of companies use us. We're in the back end. You probably don't know that, that we do, but probably your marketing department is benefiting from it. Uh, we're like, you know, like a lot of these technical products, we're a technical company um, selling to developers as well. And um, as you can see there, we're about 140 people. Um, we doubled last year in growth. We're looking to double this year again. So a lot of fast growth, which is bringing a ton of fun HR opportunities. All right, awesome. Um, so uh, just, to, just to give everyone an overview of, um, uh, of what's going to happen next is uh, we're going to talk about uh, talent KPIs uh, in, in, three, in three buckets. Um, first, we're going to look at you know, why talent KPIs are important. Um, then after that, we're going to talk about how to identify the right talent KPIs. And uh, finally, uh, you know, Richard and Adriana are going to give us uh, some of the best practices of what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, in executing on uh, maintaining good performance indicators uh, at, their, uh, at their own companies. And at the very end, we'll have some time for questions. Uh, so, so let's get into it. Um, so I'll start, you know, I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with Adriana. Um, and you know, so the, the first question we have for you is, uh, you know, wh you know when you know when did segment become kind of more data driven? Was there was there a specific tipping point when you when you kind of put your foot down and said, okay, you know, here's the reason why we need talent KPIs mm -hmm. at our company, and um, you know, this is what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So thankfully, uh, as I mentioned before, we're a data analytics company, so the idea that your decisions should be driven by data was not a novel concept for people. Um, that said, I don't think it was something that the company had used to drive HR decisions in the past, and it wasn't necessarily because they hadn't, uh, they, they didn't believe in it. It was mostly, I was the first HR person in-house. I started when there were 50 people. Um, so when I came in and I started mentioning to them that we needed to look at data, they looked at me like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense, but I didn't have a lot of pushback. Um, but what, what I did is I just really wanted to get some quick wins from the get-go. And the biggest thing that we needed to do was just establish our recruiting program. There was, um, you know, there were no recruiting recruiters in place. There were no analytics, uh, but we needed to double that year. So I went in. Thankfully, we had a system where some data had been gathered. And there were two things that I had noticed. And one was that the time to hire was extremely long. It took about three months to hire people, and, and that was just way too much in my mind. So as I started looking at all the stages, I saw that people got really stuck mostly at the application stage and people just didn't review the resumes on time. So I said, oh, well, that's a really quick win. We can just reduce time to hire really quickly just by decreasing that because it took about a month or a month and a half from the moment the person applied until the moment they got, a, they got an offer. Um, so that was one of the things. And then the other one was I started looking at the sources of hire for the company. Um, and the biggest source of hire was referrals. And that was just really exciting to me because referrals are always a really good source of hire. They generally accept. 
Uh, they're, they, they go through the funnel faster, so, um, and they're cheaper because you just have to refer them in. So uh, I just decided to double down on that one, and that just really jump-started all of our recruiting process really, really quickly and kind of gave me a quick win on using data to drive business decisions, which just then established our HR team as a data-driven HR team. Awesome. Uh, so just, just a quick follow-up on that. So what was your company uh, – so just, just remind everyone, your company size was about, uh, you said, 50 when you kind of started saying that, hey, you know, let's look at the data. Correct. Yeah, it was about 50 people. Got it. Uh, awesome. Uh, so, so same question for Richard. Uh, was there a specific point when you kind of came in and, and, and put your foot down and said, hey, we got to look at the data and you have to establish some key metrics? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say there was a specific uh, moment, but um, like Adriana at Segment uh, Data Dog, as the name suggests uh, even, we are a data-driven company. We are data analytics um, at our core as well. And so there's already a mindset here of, um, of using data to um, gain insights and to inform decision-making. Uh, and then also, as Adriana said, but it, it, there hadn't been any focus on applying that kind of data analysis and rigor to uh, the HR or people side of the business. And so when I joined, um, that is something that I uh, brought up very quickly is the need for uh, data and data insights into, into, our, um, into our employees. But we didn't have, and I, I think we'll get to this a little bit later, but I, I, you know, we didn't have really any tools in place other than uh, a recruiting platform that would um, – that would allow us to even collect and then analyze data on our employees. So that was step number one, was uh, putting in some tools to, to help us be able to do that. Uh, I was able to start, though, with uh, recruiting, and, and recruiting is arguably one of the easier places to both collect and also apply data, I think. Um, uh, it's, there, there's a lot of similarities to sales and uh, this idea of kind of the candidate funnel uh, and candidate pipeline. So we uh, certainly, at, when I joined and, and even to this point, do a lot of um, look, look quite a bit at our candidate funnel uh, and where people are dropping out, why they're dropping out, at what point um, uh, you know they do um, drop out and make changes and calibrate our recruiting process uh, as a result of that. Uh, that's uh, thanks. Thanks for that insight, Richard. Uh, I'm I'm actually wondering uh, if you've been at organizations before or seen organizations that haven't done that, and um, you know and. And, and tell us about you know one of one of your experiences uh, maybe maybe before Datadog uh, where you saw someone or you were in an organization that you know that didn't really identify or track uh, you know uh, KPIs or wasn't that data driven how it was different? Well, I think um, as the uh, saying goes, uh, you can't uh, change or fix what you don't measure. Um, and so I think uh, in, in companies where you aren't looking at your data, um, you're not, or, or I, I argue you're, you're less likely to uh, identify or know that there are problems in the organization where those problems may be. The data isn't necessarily going to tell you what exactly is wrong or even how to fix it, but it, it at least would, you know, be a... Uh, a warning sign or, you know, an early detector uh, that there may be something you need to address. Um, I would say one specific example, and it's really a, you know, very simple one, but looking at even just demographics of your organization, and uh, I, in a prior company, we hadn't um, really been doing a very good job of that and thinking about how our population was aging, how our employees were um, progressing and maturing uh, in in their uh, you know in their roles and, and, and moving into leadership ranks, such that um, we found ourselves in a position where we had a lot of very senior people and with long tenure, 
and uh, we were losing as a result a lot of our younger uh, employees and, and you know and, and more junior talent uh, because they uh, didn't have a, a path to progress within the organization. And I think that's just it's a simple example, but one where data would have helped to inform us on what was happening with respect to our uh, employee base. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I really like the uh, you know can't fix what you can't measure. Uh, I think that's something for all of us to live by, <laughs> not just not just in HR and talent, but uh, you know across across most business. Uh, Adriana, would you like to add anything to you know kind of um, you know the you know downsides of potentially not having uh, clearly defined talent KPIs, or you know have you had experiences in the past where uh, you, you know where, where you were working with 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 teams that didn't do this? Yeah, absolutely. I think. One of the reasons why using data for HR decisions is that human behavior can be incredibly counterintuitive sometimes. So going with your gut sometimes cannot, it's not the best way to approach things. Um, so, you know, my previous role, when I first started, amazingly, that there was no data applied to recruiting or to any of the HR functions other than just attrition. Um, and, and, you know, butts and seats kind of, kind of measuring. Um, and, and once we started digging deeper into some of the, the questions, we realized that some of the assumptions that we had made about, when, you know, why people were leaving or why people were dropping off from the recruiting process were completely wrong. Um, so this is why I think it's so important to be data-driven and, and not just using, as Richard said, data to, to help you fix all the problems because it won't, but it will help highlight areas that you need to dig deeper into so that you can find the actual reasons and solutions towards those problems. Uh, makes total sense. So uh, yeah, so so let's um, you know so let, let's get let's get into uh, some some more uh, some more some more meaty stuff. Um, I think everyone here might be wondering, uh, you know, that, you know may, maybe everyone here already wants to set good talent KPIs for their organization. Um, but every organization is different, and uh, I, you know, I did notice that um, you know the key KPIs for both segment and Datadog are different. And so I'm really curious to hear from from both of you, starting with Adriana, uh, about you know how you know how did you go about choosing the KPIs to track, and you know were there were there specific goals that you were trying to accomplish, and then you know do you, you know do you think that any one of those KPIs uh, should apply to every organization? Um, sure. Good, good question. And, and that's a question I get very often. A ton of people always ask me, what are the HR KPIs that I should be measuring? And although there are some that I think are, are um, somewhat common to most companies, saying what are the HR KPIs I should be measuring is probably not the right question to ask. I think the right question to ask should be, what are the business uh, challenges that I, have, that I have in front of me? What are the business goals that I'm trying to meet? and then using HR data to help drive those business decisions as opposed to doing a bottoms-up approach of trying to measure absolutely everything. Um, you need to be a, not just aligned with the business, but HR data should drive the business decisions. So that's why you need to, to do it top-down. Um, for, for us at Segment, the, the biggest challenge that we had when I first started was recruiting. So, you know, we were trying to bring in a ton of people. We were trying to figure out how many people we had to bring into the recruiting team, where people were dropping off. Um, so that was one of the first things that we started taking a look at, the, the, the whole funnel. As Richard mentioned, right, it's, it's kind of like a sales funnel. So you want to understand who's coming in, where are they dropping off, um, and, and how can you build efficiencies in there. Uh, but even, even more is then you're trying to bring in all these people. So um, we wanted to take a look at the onboarding data and making sure that it was, um, you know, people were, were very happy with the company after the first 90 days because that just Im improves retention if you can get uh, an onboarding process that makes sense. Um, and then another thing we needed to do was just really grow our revenue. So we're looking to grow the sales team, and we started taking a look at, okay, it takes us this long to onboard, to hire and onboard a salesperson. By this time, they're breaking even or they're hitting their quota. This is the um, attrition rate of salespeople, and based on all of that information, we figured out how many people we needed to hire for sales and when we needed to start hiring for them to really meet our revenue goals. So that's like a clear example of, Revenue goals tied to HR data. That's uh, yeah, that's actually really cool. So you could actually go to the executive team and say, "Hey, 
we're tracking attrition, and this is how attrition is going to affect kind of the company's annual numbers. And you know, they're thereby making you know they're thereby making you know both the metrics you're tra- tracking and your team uh, kind of a key part of like the overall company strategy. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, that's really cool. And so and so. Uh, uh, you know, Richard, I, I noticed that one of your one of your KPIs is fill rate, um, but the, but then there's also you know there's also um, a, a slightly less specific KPI that's engagement. So I'm I'm wondering mm-hmm. um, why you chose those specific uh, you know why you chose those specific KPIs, and if you think that uh, there's any KPIs that are important for everyone to have. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I, I certainly agree with Adriana that uh, it's important to first think about uh, the business. Both the, you know, what the business challenges are, what the business uh, goals and objectives are, and then uh, work from there to HR uh, and HR metrics that are going to uh, drive those uh, those desired outcomes. Um, I so in terms of engagement, uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, it is a bit more uh, nebulous. Um, but I also think that it's something that um, is a leading indicator of um, attrition. And so if we're measuring engagement, which we do through a couple of um, uh, surveys each year, uh, as well as I, I, I said to my founders once, you know, if they asked me, well, how do you measure engagement? And I said, well, one way you can measure engagement is just to walk around the floor and you can – feel it. You can tell, right? It just, uh, it's in the air whether people are engaged or not. But also using data through a survey, for example, to help um, us assess uh, engagement of our employees uh, globally. And then, as I said, that it's, it's an indicator of a lot of things, but a leading indicator also of, uh, of, of attrition. And so that's something that like Adriana is, uh, you know, very important to us to manage and ensure that we keep uh, low because attrition can be quite costly. Um, but that is, uh, you know, and then engagement, of course, has a lot of uh, uh, ties also to productivity. And, you know, more productivity translates into increased revenue, increased profitability for the organization. So to me, an engagement, while a bit nebulous, it does – have some uh, very strong correlations to business outcomes. Got it. Uh, makes total sense. And so um, I'm curious for both uh, uh, for both of you. Um, do you try to put a you know put a number figure um, on on kind of your engagement metric? Uh, is there I mean, you know do you use like an N, you know like an NPS engagement score type thing, or you know do you have like a you know we sampled 50 percent of People by walking around and you know, ten of them said this kind of kind of number. Uh, you don't have to share the numbers from your company. I'm just wondering if you have a number. Well, for uh, us, Adriana. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sure, no worries. Yeah, we do. We do have a number. We we do a pulse survey every quarter. Um, so it's just a small survey that has ten questions that people can answer within three minutes. And and one of those questions is. How, off, how likely are you to recommend segment as a good place to work? Um, and that's what we use as our NPS score. And, and we measure it every quarter to kind of just track and see how we're doing. Uh, similar. Uh, that, that, that's I mean, great, Richard. Say, sorry. sorry, yeah, I wouldn't say that we have, uh, so I, I, we don't have necessarily an NPS, and, and nor do we have a specific target uh, per se. Our survey includes that, that same question, uh, however, that Adriana mentioned, which I, I, I agree is very important. Um, and I think for us and, and my approach to uh, some of our, our data and metrics in general is not so much about a benchmark, but rather um, where we are and are we better than we were the last time. And are we, uh, and do we, you know, continue to move in that direction? Uh, you know, I, I like to say, are we moving up and to the right uh, with up and to the right being a good thing? And um, that's what I'm more concerned about than necessarily a specific metric. Now, at, at the end of the day, of course, I, I'd like to see, you know, all metrics around engagement uh, 
it to be, uh, you know, as high as they possibly can be. Uh, that, yeah, that's uh, that's re that's really uh, that's really interesting because a lot of people uh, these days are obsessing about trying to figure out industry benchmarks, and uh, in that world, um, uh, I'm I'm totally with you on that point where um, it's actually it's actually better sometimes to compete against yourself on these metrics than to try and yeah. uh, than than to try and aim for a different organization, which you know which is not you know it's just not the same and doesn't have the same goals as you. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it's helpful certainly to you know, understand what engagement or, or, or what certain metrics might look like at other companies or in some kind of uh, company uh, or industry average, rather. So we use uh, Culture Amp as our, um, is the, the survey tool that we use, and they also uh, have some industry uh, benchmarking data uh, that, uh, that they compile and share. So we are able to see that, and I, you know, certainly we'll look at that sometimes, but um, I, but I, at the end of the day, yeah, I'm more I'm more focused and more concerned about what our own metrics are and how they are changing over time. Uh, and that's actually uh, I'm glad you mentioned mentioned culture around because uh, that that dovetails perfectly into what I was going to ask you next is that. Uh, you know what are you know what are a couple of the tools that you you know that you use or really like um, to to track your KPIs or to act on them, and uh, you know what would you recommend to our audience as uh, as a as a really good way to present um, KPIs and progress on their KPIs to the executive team? Start with Richard. Um, so uh, you know the. Uh, there are, we're in a world now where I think that we're able to collect a lot of data, and there are also a lot of tools available to us uh, in the HR space. I think that is, you know, both good and bad in a way. I mean, it's certainly an exciting time, in my opinion, to be part of HR and, and um, getting exposed to uh, this, you know, some, what uh, is some really great uh, HR tech. Um, but it also means that there can be a lot of, um, a lot of noise and there are a lot of tools that may be measuring things that sound like um, they would be of value but aren't necessarily. Uh, in terms of specific tools, I, you know, I already mentioned Culture Amp. That is one that we use. Um, it's, uh, you know, basically a, a, a survey uh, platform, but it is c c tailored specifically to um, workplaces and uh, particularly focused around uh, engagement. and. So we use that for, um, we do a couple of different onboarding uh, surveys for new hires at their first week and then first 60 days. Uh, we do an engagement survey twice a year, as I mentioned. Uh, we also use it to uh, conduct exit surveys so that we're collecting that, that data on, uh, on the back end. Um, <clears throat> and then we uh, use the, the platform on, uh, on an ad hoc basis as well. In terms of presenting uh, data, you know, that is something, too, that I, I think is really uh, challenging because there is so much data that we can collect, and, and I, I think for many of us we do already collect, and then figuring out how to distill it into uh, the most meaningful um, insights and then presenting that to the leadership team uh, is definitely not easy. Uh, I also, and I'd, I'd like to get Adriana's perspective on this, but <laughs> as I said, we are a data-driven company. We have a lot of very, you know, we have a lot of data scientists, very, you know, data-oriented individuals who like to just get the data. Like, don't worry about presenting it to me, <laughs> you know, in some nice uh, uh, dashboard or, you know, little chart. Like, just give me all the raw data and I will uh, manipulate it myself probably a little bit different than at, at, at many other companies, but given we are so data focused, uh, a lot of my stakeholders just want that, that raw information. Uh, Adriana, what do you, uh, what do you think? Um, how, uh, how does your team present, uh, you know, present talent KPIs and progress to, to the executive yeah. team? And are there any specific tools that you use? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so yes, absolutely. There were data driven and like Richard spoke, they, they sometimes want to take a look at all the raw data or want to dig very, very deep. 
Um, but in general, we do use a number of tools. We use CultureAmp as well for our surveys. We, we use Greenhouse for our ATS. We use Bamboo HR for uh, our HRIS. Um, and I think the most important thing for whatever tool you use, and it doesn't matter because they all somehow do the same thing, but it's just to make sure that all of them talk to each other. There's a lot of HR tools out there, and, and the important thing is that the data is not just floating around in, in, in different different locations. It, it's just really that they all they all merge because I look at the employee entire story from the second they engage with us through their recruiting process, through onboarding, through um, you know the days that they leave, and and it's important to just have all that information in one place. Um, in terms of how to present the data, there's like four things that I like to take a look at when I'm presenting data. One of them is just to make sure that the data is relevant. As we have mentioned before, we want to make, there's a lot of noise, so I like to make sure that it's top-down approach. Other than just taking a look at all the data, what is the business issue that we're trying to solve? What's the question that we want to answer? Um, the second one, and this one is very important, especially for a data-driven company, is the quality of the data. I want to make sure that the leaders and the executive team are educated as to what it means, how do you define the piece of data that you're giving them, and that it's actually valid, that you're following a process that, that makes the data valid as well. Um, I want to make sure that it is compelling. So when I'm talking about the data, I'm not just saying, oh, this is the attrition number, or this is the recruiting number. I want to make sure that I'm telling a story around it because it just gives them a little bit of context um, even though they're, they're data people, they don't understand HR as well as the people who work in HR do. So it's important to give them that story. And, and then lastly, it's just make it actionable. So I want to give them actionable analytics. I want to have them walk out of there with something in their hand that they can say, okay, now this is what I can do to improve on this data or to change my behavior or, or just to, to engage on. Yeah. Yeah, just to uh, add to that also, um, we, we use uh, Greenhouse for our recruiting platform as well. And then on the HR side, we use uh, Namely, uh, HRIS. And I uh, totally echo uh, Adriana's point about ensuring that your systems uh, talk to each other uh, as much as possible or as best as possible. It's not, it's not always realistic, but it is, uh, it is definitely a uh, downside of having multiple systems is that you can end up with these disparate uh, data sources that are all on the same population, uh, but you're not able to gather and look at uh, holistically. So the best that you can do that, and you know, even if that is, and this uh, might be more of a hack, but downloading that data to uh, Excel spreadsheets and then and then you know kind of merging the data there and serving up some uh, uh, tables and graphs uh, could be could be very powerful. Uh, awesome. <clears throat> thanks for yeah. Thank, th thanks thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah. As a as, as someone who's been on both sides of the table, either presenting uh, talent data to leadership or being presented talent data from people who are working on it. Uh, I think uh, I think telling the story is actually really really important because when someone comes uh, you know as uh, you know when you're working with talent professionals when someone comes to you and says hey uh, you know this is our attrition number like that's not terribly useful information but when someone comes in and says hey our attrition number has gone up by 10 percent uh, you know quarter over quarter for the last three quarters um, you know this means that we need to do something about it and you know like at the very least like let's let you know let's have an let, let's have an open house session where people can come and ask questions um, you know that's uh, you know coming in with like suggestions about how to improve also is like really uh, is like really useful and uh, and I think way more actionable for uh, the executive team uh, one thing uh, for the audience um, so you get uh, you can all start typing in questions into uh, you know in, into the web interface that you're attending the webinar through um, so that way, uh, in a couple of minutes, we can start taking some of those questions, uh, and uh, and Richard and Adriana can try and answer them. Um, and we're we're almost you know we're almost at the tail end of uh, of all you know of the scheduled topics that we wanted to talk about. Um, you know, so so the last you know the last question that I had for for both Richard and Adriana was, uh, you know, what do you think uh, you know what do you think is going to be the evolution of companies using talent KPIs? Do you think that there you know there's specific metrics that are going to become more or less important? And uh, do you think that um, you know? Do, do you think that there are any metrics that no one has thought about yet that are going to become more relevant in the future? Um, uh, let's start with Richard. 
Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a um, that's a that's a tough question. I think I'm not sure if there is a specific KPI or you know metric that is going to uh, come to the foreground um, in, in in a universal sense. But I, I think what the future though of talent KPIs uh, is is that uh, we're going to get better at it. So I think that our systems are going to we're going to have systems that are equipped uh, to handle data, to process data, and to serve up uh, insights on uh, data, and and I mean specifically for our employees, because this exists obviously in other places within the business, um, but, you know, for most, I, for many companies, the, the number one asset is its people, yet I think it's where we have uh, the least amount of data and insights um, in 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 many many cases. So I think that that future the future is that there will be a lot more measuring and analysis of all aspects of employees demographics, employee life cycle, employee performance, uh, and contribution and impact over time. Uh, I completely All agree right. with it, that. And it's, yeah, and I think like we, we have kind of referenced the fact that, you know, recruiting is very similar to sales. And I would say, you know, you, you take a look at the entire employee life cycle. And if you equate that to what companies do when they're taking a look at their customers, there's also the marketing piece and the product piece. So just really understanding data to a deeper level. I don't think it's necessarily are there pieces of data that we're not taking a, a look at now or there are, that we haven't thought about. It's just really there's so much data out there that we're not utilizing at all, um, and we need to start thinking of our employees as our, as our customers to an extent um, and, and using data in, in a way that it's not just analyzing trends in the past, but really how are you going to be using that data to predict um, you know, your attrition or performance or who you're going to hire, those kinds of things. So I think using more data, having it more at the tip of your fingers and using it more for predictive reasons um, yeah. or purposes can, can be, will be, will be more in the future. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, un yeah, unsolicited thought from me about this is that uh, I actually think that uh, one of the best ways to measure things like engagement and getting leading indicators of attrition um, is is through employee activity, and I think that's something that isn't really measured a lot. Um, and uh, my my prediction would be that uh, we'll try to derive more conclusions from employee activity rather than by asking employees direct questions in the future. Like for example, you know, it's like how many times did they log into Slack or how many emails are they sending a day and things like that. Um, but that's just a quick thought from me. Uh, and uh, we have uh, so now I wanted to open it open it up for questions. And uh, our first question is from Chris Hickey, and he says, uh, "Would having a skill gap focus with mentoring help you be more prescriptive rather than reactive to attrition? Uh, what tools are you using for skill gaps, and how actively uh, how can you actively show a journey to address those?" Um, so, uh, who would like to take it first? So the, the skill gap one is, is an interesting one that we just took a look at. Um, as, as I've mentioned before, we're not a huge company. We're 140 people. But we, we have grown very, very quickly. And what that means is that even though we have hired managers um, who come with experience, we have also promoted a ton of people who are new managers. So one of the things that we did recently was um, – we did two things. One is we did this exercise of a nine box where we plotted people in, um, in a grid where one axis was performance and the other axis was potential. And I sat down with all of the leads and we plotted everybody. And for, for folks that um, were high potential and, and wherever they were in the performance piece, it was like, what are the skills that are needed to bring them to that next level? Um, and that just gave me some data in terms of identifying where is the organization going to be a year or two years from now and what are the skills that I need to develop. And then we also did a survey with managers where I took a look at the nine skills that, um, that Google has identified as the top skills that make good managers. 
And I asked the managers, you know, how, how important do you think this role, this skill is for your role? How um, confident do you feel using it? And how hard do you think it, it is to, to learn it? And that just gave me a lot of data in terms of where I needed to focus and what the biggest levers were in combination with those, um, those skills of the nine box that I, that I found. So that just gave me a little bit of information as to where I needed to focus first instead of kind of boiling the ocean trying to provide all this training and all of these skills um, for, for folks. Hmm. Yeah, so Datadog, we're a little bit bigger than um, – than Adriana's company, but but not not too much. So about 350 employees. You know, skill gap. Um, I certainly agree, and I'm not quite sure if this was what the question was getting at, but I certainly agree. Like mentoring and mentorship, whether it's uh, peer mentor mentorship internally or or, or uh, introducing somebody to an external mentor, can be really helpful uh, in terms of not just addressing a skill gap, but um, but just developing, uh, you know, as a as a professional uh, with the company. So I think that's really important in terms of identifying the skill gap. There are obviously a couple of different. Well, I should say obviously, but there are a couple of different uh, viewpoints that I think Adriana is already articulating. One is, what are the skills that we as a company, as an organization, um, believe that we need now and you know, two or three years into the future. Uh, and how does that compare to the skill sets of our existing, uh, you know, population? In terms of how we, uh, so that's what you know, it's kind of at the company at the company view. But then I also think there's a kind of skill gap analysis at the individual level, and that is career development uh, in career, you know, related to career path. Uh, you know, I as a as an individual employee. You know, what do I want to, how do I want to progress professionally? And then how, what are the skills that I am lacking today or what is the experience that I'm lacking today and how do I gain those things uh, over the next one, two, or three years in order to move to the next level or next role or function or whatever it might be, uh, you know, for myself in my career. And then that's also a conversation um, that has to take place should be taking place between uh, that individual and his or her manager. So I think that's how I kind of come at skill gap is a couple different ways from a company perspective, individual perspective, and then where HR can can help and, and play a role is to try bridging those two things. Um, sometimes you know there there may be somebody who has a uh, an objective. For their for themselves in their career that you know just isn't going to match the 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 needs and, and objectives of the organization um, and uh, you know in those rare cases that leads to or should lead to conversation about how that how the company can support that person probably in uh, finding a different company in a different role elsewhere. And, and quick follow up: um, Are there any are there any specific tools that you use in house, or are you kind of or is this all homegrown when you're trying to analyze like you know performance versus potential, or uh, or trying to figure out the skill gaps? Yeah, for now it's uh, it's it's not um, systematic. Um, we are, as I said, we use Namely uh, as well as other tools, so we're starting to capture some of this data there. Um, but uh, but we're still we're still building it and still working our way up to having a full kind of macro view of all of this. Uh, got it. Thanks. So we're almost at time. Um, so we have we have 30 more seconds. Uh, so I'll just ask a very one very last question uh, to both Adrian and Richard. Is that uh, if uh, you know it. If anyone in the audience wants to go and learn more about how to how to create good talent KPIs, or if there's any resources that you would recommend people go and, and look at um, after after this webinar, uh, what would they be? Start with Adriana. Oh gosh, uh, there's so much information out there. I think that's a good thing about where we are right now as, as an HR organization is that it's moving away from being all about comp and ban and tactical to being a lot more strategic. So there's a ton of information out there. I, take, I like taking a look at 
um, you know, the HBR articles and, and then some other books. But, but really, I don't think it's just looking at HR data. A lot of the information is already out there, as I've mentioned before, if you take a look at how to interpret customer data, because it's, it's very similar to that. So that's pr pretty much where I would start um, and then start equating that to, to your people function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly uh, HBR, uh, I think, is a really good resource uh, just in general. Uh, I would say, um, and, and I, I actually just uh, went to this conference, a few, it took place a few weeks ago. Uh, it's put on at uh, the Wharton School at UPenn called People Analytics Conference. It's been around for just a few years. This was the fourth year that it took place. And um, uh, folks might be familiar with Adam Grant, who uh, wrote a book called Give and Take, and then more recently one called Originals. And so he's one of the, the main organizers of this event. And uh, it was a really fascinating uh, conference uh, meeting, uh, and, and obviously many of the attendees were people from corporations, uh, big and small, who are attempting to tackle these types of issues around, you know, our data and analytics and what to do with our data and how to make it uh, more meaningful and um, uh, have greater impact on, uh, on, the, on the organizations that, which we serve. Uh, so that, I, I would recommend taking a look at that conference. Uh, it, uh, as I said, it just took place, so I think next year, you know, it's, it's probably about a year away, next March, to take a look at that. And also in general, uh, I, would, I would encourage people to look at the Wharton People Analytics uh, website and uh, team there uh, because I think they're um, one of the uh, real kind of leaders right now in uh, research around people analytics. Uh, that's awesome. I didn't know about the Wharton, uh, about the, about the Wharton uh, resources. That's really great to know. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we're almost at time, and so I want to hand it back to uh, Casey and Sarah from OpenView. Thanks, Maniac, and, and thank you, Adriana and Richard, for your time today, and also to the audience. Thanks for joining us. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll be sending out the deck and recording if any questions come up. So if you have any lingering questions just based on anything we talked about today, don't hesitate to reach out, and I'll facilitate in getting those answered for you. Um, just a quick note, we have another talent-focused webinar coming up on May 10th, Defining Culture and Values at Your Expansion Stage Company. So again, that will be on May 10th. Um, keep an eye on that and also on OpenView's event page for other upcoming webinars. And we look forward to uh, seeing you all soon. Thank you for joining.